Discovery is still using the spore drive, and uh, these guys back here, you know, in this way fl far flung distant future, they're slow. They're going warp 9.999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
he's not losing his legacy. And then again, during the same episode, Stamets looks off into the distance. Wow, imagine having such a legacy. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, maybe this should have been like in the middle of the season. I don't know. We're kind of like showing our hand here. Um, and hey, I want Stamets and Culver and Adira to go on an adventure. I want to see them, you know, on a planet, you know, uh, maybe swinging off a vine. I don't know. Something cool like that. I don't, I don't know. Man. I'm just, maybe I'm losing my mind. But I, this is the last season. And it would be appropriate if every character got something crazy to do. You know, kind of make this uh, a grab bag season. You know, uh, what do they call that thing? A smorgasbord. Um, so maybe that's where we're going with Stamets here. I can't believe they're going with the pathway drive. I don't know what I'm supposed to think about that. I haven't seen the pathway drive. Maybe the pathway drive is just better. Take special note of the things that they're mentioning in the first episode of a season. Right? This is important because if they're smart, I don't know if they are or not really, they would really be establishing these core ideas in the first episode, that being the pathway drive, Stamets dealing with the loss of the spore drive being canceled. Good. I thought we established that the spore drive was like bad in previous seasons that you're messing with like the mycelial network and stuff like that. Like it's not exactly a good idea. That was what I took from the last few seasons. So I don't know what I'm supposed to think about this. And similarly, I'm also not supposed to, th am, I, am I supposed to like not know what the significance of red directive actually means? Like what, what is red directive essentially? What's with all the mystery? Um, we're setting up Red Directive, Pathway Drive. They said Pathway Drive. Are we going to see the debut of the Pathway Drive at the end of the season? Is the Enterprise going to use Pathway Drive? Wouldn't it be cool if we show a ship being constructed and it's like the first one that's built around the Pathway Drive and then it saves the day at the last second? You know, not outshining Discovery. This is Discovery's show. I'm really spitballing here, so if you'll forgive me. I did put a poll up about whether or not going to see the Enterprise. Or whether or not we're going to see it. Um, that's beside the point. Burnham is interrupted by Admiral Vance. Here's a little... A little toy. It's, it's a little... Infinity symbol. An 8. It transports them to the Infinity Room. Uh, which is kind of like what I assume to be a portable holodeck. Imagine the news conferences you could have. Hey, check check out this keynote. Okay, cool. Where can I watch it? Come to this uh, auditorium. I have it here in my infinity room, which fits in the palm of my hand. Bink. And they go off into, you know, vast white nothingness to discuss what this red directive is. Vance Kovic and Burnham. Imagine if Kovic is the villain this season. Is that possible? I had uh, that mind thought here, right in here, inside of my head. There's this thing called a brain. It's very tiny. and Sometimes it has interesting thoughts. And one of them, when I was watching episode one, was could it be that Kovic is the villain? I don't know. He seems kind of fishy. Then again, maybe they know that I know. And they know that I know that they know. And they know that I know that they know that I know. So they're going to do a double, triple, quadruple backflip on me and turn out that, no, Kovic is the good guy. Whatever. We have to go find this derelict Romulan ship from 800 years ago. That's more my style, baby. This would appear to be something from, like, kind of like a, that time between TNG and Picard. If we subtract 800 years from uh, the date of this episode, I don't worry. I ran the numbers, and you can trust me that this took place somewhere, like, between TNG and, like, that post-TNG era. Um, so what's on this ship? We need to go get it. And it doesn't matter who we kill along the way. It's a red directive. What does that mean? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. Kovic said, quote, 
he's not at liberty to discuss it. So Admiral Vance doesn't know. Kovach is not at liberty to discuss it. So, I mean, that means the Red Directive comes from above him. Why can't we just ask the president? Can we ask Rilek? You know, uh, who was it? Lara? Was that her name? Rilek? The president of the United Federation of Planets? Maybe we could say, hey, listen, what's this Red Directive about? Well, you don't have to know. Well, maybe if we knew, we'd be able to execute this mission better. Maybe that's a little bit better than Kovic just telling Burnham, you go find this ship, the Antares will be going with you, I don't care what happens. Essentially what I'm getting here is that it doesn't, the, the secret of the Red Directive, what it's protecting, this thing on this Romulan ship that's very old, that just showed up in a quote, uh, like a, a, a large gravity well planet that is essentially a junkyard, is so significant that it doesn't matter what happens along the way. You know, so... You have a license to kill. You know, like that show, 007. You know the one I'm talking about. Discovery is still using the spore drive, and uh, these guys back here, you know, in this way far flung distant future, they're slow. They're going warp 9.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
Picard season three, uh, opens up below Michael, blows a hole in the ship. She falls out of the ship. A suit materializes on her. And, uh, you know, when you're working on CGI, it's better if you don't show a character's face. Because when you see a character's face and you focus on it, it kind of brings out the fakeness. Because what we're trying to do here is we have a 3D model that's rigged and animated animated one way. And then we have to have our actor's face superimposed on it. And that's when the brain, it, it trips the brain's fakeness alarm. This whole sequence doesn't show Michael's face after she falls out of that ship. Suit materializes. She floats around in space. We get more space flying. We get more superhero space flying in a suit. She gets banged by something. It doesn't kill her. I don't know. Future technology. It's littered with tension-dissolving dialogue. If I fell flat on my face right now and broke my nose, do you think I'd say, oh, man, that hurt? Or like, uh, well, you don't see that every day. Very funny. Um, but uh, <laughs> instead of just being immediately transported back to Discovery... Um, she just actually falls onto the cloaked ship. She like, sees where it is and, like, kind of, I don't know, operates the suit's thrusters in such a way as to land on it. Uh, and, you know, this is Maul and Lack's ship. I hoped it was Maul and Lack's ship and it wasn't some other ship. Wouldn't that be funny if it was just some different ship? Oh, there's more people here. Oh, where did where did Burnham go? I don't know. <laughs> she lands on the ship it gets away at warp and she's on it of course she's inside the warp bubble we're safe take that uh, uh, Tucker remember that time in the Enterprise when uh, uh, the Columbia and the Enterprise were at warp and they shared the same warp bubble and uh, Tucker like moved between them on a rope or something <laughs> uh, anyway Burnham's outside the ship on the surface at warp the Antares shows up at warp the Discovery shows up at warp, we have three ships nominally inside the same local space at warp uh, with Burnham trying to disable the engines of Maul and Lack's ship, which would fulfill, you know, the red directive, such as, you know, we're getting this object that we needed to get, according to Dr. Kovich, that was stolen by Maul and Lack. If you're confused, that's fine, because I was confused. I was visually confused. Uh... A running, uh, you know, visual motif of Star Trek Discovery Season 4 was visual confusion. Um, I'm bedazzled and uh, thunderstruck by the amount of amazing technology uh, thrown in front of my face. You know, a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And uh, <laughs> too much technology on screen is ind indistinguishable from a kaleidoscope. And there was a moment, there was moments in Season 4 where I couldn't, figure out what was visually going on and I was getting that here in this episode I mean you can't say it wasn't exciting but you can't say it was kind of confusing so excitement and confusion I've seen a lot worse uh, we're on this ship we're arguing with Captain Rayner from the Antares and I'm just thinking my god Admiral Vance why couldn't Admiral Vance just say who's in charge why did he just say when we're leaving on this mission, whose mission is this? Is this Rainer's or Burnham's? And then uh, Admiral Vance is like, doesn't want to play favorites, even though he's the Admiral, and says, like, work together. Hey, kids, work together. Remember, what is this? Uh, I don't know. This feels like the PSA from the end of a Saturday morning television program for children. Kids, work together. So at the at the most important possible moment, when Burnham is on the outside of the ship trying to disable its engines while it's at warp, we have a petty argument between Rayner and Burnham. Rayner makes it personal. You know, are you going to get off that ship, Burnham, and let me tractor beam this thing? And they're counting on me not... They're counting on me backing away, and they're going to blow up. It's going to destroy the Antares, but you better be out of there in time before that happens. No, I need to stay here and, and destroy the engine. And then Rainer says something like, oh, that's whatever, blah, 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 coming from you. Rainer has been briefed on Michael Burnham. I'm sure everyone was because they're from the past. It's not exactly a common thing. 
And it's just, it, it felt like, I don't know, I felt like these people were like 13 years old. And, you know, it's not 100% their fault, right? They should have known the chain of command here. What is the command hierarchy we need to follow? It's just, it's sheer luck this works out the way it does, right? If we had have known who was really in control here and it failed, we'd know who to blame. If it succeeded, we'd know who to blame. But when you don't have it, you know, well, we're just going to chance it. We just kind of chance it. Like Star Trek, we're just kind of rely on luck. Luck is a factor, guys. Don't worry about it. We're just going to use luck. So we somehow get away with this. Uh, the ship exits warp or something. Wait, what happened? I just watched this. What happened? The ship Maul Akron. It's warp. Did Burnham stays on the ship? <laughs> it's warp bubble must have collapsed. She didn't die. The ship stopped. It launched uh, warp signature spoofing devices, like chaff, around it that warped in different directions. Very cool. The Antares must have let go of its tractor beam. And Michael Burnham flies through space basically go, hits directly into the bridge, uh, transports before she hits what I assume is the bridge view screen, transports in front behind it from in front of it <laughs> into the bridge like that, and sits down in her chair. Business as usual, I guess. And great, Maul and Lack get away. Get away. Kovic is like, this is the part where you tell me you have a brilliant idea. Guys, what do you think the brilliant idea is? How do we catch fugitives? Well, we open up a book. No, we talked a book. Okay. So we spore drive to book wherever he is. I don't know, some ringed planet you can see in the shuttle bay. Uh, and we find out that Michael Burnham's relationship with book and similarly Tarina's in a relationship with um, uh, Seru, and similarly, what I assume Culber's relationship with Stamets, we'll see how that plays out, are uh, quote unquote, it's complicated. I don't know what, how, do, how does anybody, are there families in Starfleet at all? Do they, do they occur at all? Have you noticed this? Like, uh, the relationship between uh, Picard and Beverly, spoiler for season three of Picard, is complicated. It's compli complicated between Book and Burnham, and it's it's probably complicated between uh, Seru and uh, Tarina. I bet you it's going to get, you know, something's going to happen. We need drama. We have drama all the time. So if something's going to happen between Culber and Stamets. I hope not, but it's going to happen probably. What? How? Maybe it would be cool in the future to have another Star Trek series where, like, maybe the captain is married to somebody on the ship. And everything's fine. That might be, you know, something you could do. I, it's, I don't think that's impossible, right? Um, anyway, uh, that's very beside the point. Uh, Book and Burnham are saying, like, okay, uh, Book, I know you just did a lot of very, very very dangerous possibly Federation destroying stuff at the end of season 4, Discovery but the Federation has basically got you uh, as their errand boy now, you know, you're picking up garbage I'm doing community service Book is doing community service, he's helping refugees displaced by the DMA that big whatchamacallit from season 4 but can you help us with this stuff too? you're a courier you deal with um thieves um, could you tell us maybe where, uh, Maul and Lack probably went? Okay, sure. Oh, they went to this place. Quimau, or something. Always with the... And then the word, right? Quimau! Because we put that little line there. There's a letter, and then the word. It's in Star Trek. We have to go to this planet. Uh, and may I add, 
when we spore drive there and the Antares eventually gets there as well. It plays a very interesting little musical number here. I thought it was very cool. It was jazzy. It was TOS-y. Very nice. Um, it was adventurous. And it really, you know, it hooked me, right? It took a little fish hook and stuck it in my mouth and, went, argh, argh, and then pulled me up over the side of the boat and then got me in the net when they first went to this plane. I was kind of into it when I saw this. I don't know why. You know, maybe it goes beyond the logical, beyond the rational, and hooking into my mental faculties that are maybe, you know, less than less than serious and more emotional. We can say that. I guess I'm along for a train ride here. We get down to this planet, and uh, this planet is where uh, the only people that would be interested in buying relics um, from an 800-year-old ship, the Romulan ship in this case, this is where Maul and Lack are. We need to find a guy called Fred. Just Fred. Maybe he can join the Federation. I'll be here all week. Whatever. Uh, Fred is a sin, 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 sin. Or as we used to call it, an android. <laughs> Back in my day, we called that an android. And then everybody got the update, and then now they call it a synth. I don't know why. It's a Sung-type android. We're Sunging it up again. Yeah, guys. Guess what? We got more Sung. We're Sunging it. This is Trek. It's Sung time. I was waiting for Brent Spiner. Where's my, where's my spent Briner? Where is he? Um, no, just kidding. Um, there's no Brent Spiner here, but there is a Sung style Android. Um, and that's who Fred is. The person who buys things, it's Fred. He's like Data. He's a yellow guy with kind of black hair and yellow eyes. Uh, and he looks very, uh, robotic. And he has a very, he has an interesting way of talking. He says, it's so effervescent that you two have come here. He has like a stilted, awkward, and kind of like, unusual and fake sounding vocabulary it's it's cool i liked it it's it's so cool that when he died i said there's no way he's dead he's a robot we can fix him he's a robot we have the technology we can fix him i don't know he stays dead for the whole episode uh maul and lack stupidly stupid i've never ever would have done this they take the romulan puzzle box thing they got off the ship you know, the most important thing in the universe. And they just put it on the desk. There you go. Clunk. What's this worth? Man, I would have, like, held it like this. And just let him get a peek. What do you think this is worth? Peek in here. Here, I have it in my creepy bag. I would never just put it on the desk. What do you think happens? He offers three bars of latinum. Haha, <laughs> we're not taking three bars of latinum. Uh, and you're leaving the merchandise here, thanks. So he just says, Okay, you didn't like the deal. I'm forcing you to leave. And I'm stealing your merchandise. What kind of deal is that? How does this person operate like that? That doesn't... You. What you're saying is that you actually cannot barter with this person. It is impossible. He's a robot. I guess he just knows better. I don't know, but I, I, for me personally, I would never put that on the desk. A fight ensues. You can see it coming a mile away. Uh, you know, one of those kind of like uh, fisticuffs, martial arts, very fast um, fighting that you would see in Trek today. The Trek of today. That should be a magazine. Would you subscribe to a magazine called Trek Today? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we end up killing Fred, taking back our Romulan puzzle box thing. Um, Rainer, Michael, and Book arrive. Um, they're fighting on, like, what to do. And, uh, Rainer transports in slightly later. And it's like, I love interrupting something. He says something like that. And I just, I am, I am in. I am in like Flynn. I'm in. Do not kill Rainer, please. Why is, why is Trek right now so good? at introducing random new characters, getting their characterization perfect, and then, like, 
getting rid of them or they're gone. Like, I love Shaw. I love Rainer now. Remember Buck from Strange New Worlds? That one episode um, about the about the Klingon War? Buck, played by fantastic Clint Howard, was there for like two seconds and I loved him. Just, you know, just to bring up Strange New Worlds. Um, we're so good at just bringing in random characters that are immediately lovable and then... Uh, you know, forgetting about them. And then we have to go back to our characters. The characters we're focused on. Who tend to be a little bit more boring. <laughs> but Rainer is, I think, is a great foil for Burnham and Book. Especially in this scene. And especially later. When they're arguing over what to do. Let's do this. Let's do that. Rainer barges in. How about let's go? Cornerstone for the whole episode in my mind. I'm saying it in my mind over and over and over again. How about let's go? Did you notice Michael Burnham's little catchphrase is let's fly? How about this? How about let's go? <laughs> Where would I be if I was Maul and Lack? Will I be getting the heck out of here? We need to follow their ship. We got to take these uh, sand, what are they called? Sand speeder, sand bike. It's like a floating bike thing. They're just, they're just on bikes, okay? We're flying around on bikes. It's all very fun. It's very adventurous. It's very dangerous. But we need to catch this ship. And where's it going? Where is it going? It's flying away. Somehow we can catch this starship on bikes. I don't know. Uh, we have to get again after this ship. This season better not turn into get back here, Maul and Lack. Get back here, Maul and Lack. Just like uh, season four was get back here, book. Hey, book, get back here. If this whole season turns into Maul and Lack, get back here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hate it. I mean that Fred did open the puzzle box. Good. Plus, he looks at the book inside. Good. We're not doing more of that um, wondering what's in the puzzle box for the entire goddamn season. We're unraveling it. Literally, in this case, we open the puzzle box. I'm liking that. I'm, I'm, lo I'm locked in. I'm jacked in. Okay? I want to catch this ship. Book, Rainer, Michael, are we going to catch this ship? Uh, the ship is going into... Uh, a cave system inside the mountain. We can't allow that to happen. Antares, shoot at that mountain and block it off. Oh, there's a 30% chance we're going to cause an avalanche. Let's go with it anyway. And then Rainer's pretty cool here. Orders the ship to shoot that mountain. It does work. We don't get an avalanche. By the way, is it called an avalanche if it's rocks and sand? I thought that would be like a rock slide. I don't know. Um, but you gave them an idea, Rainer. The uh, Malalak ship, I don't know what it's called yet, shoots a, uh, shoots again at the mountain to cause the avalanche that they almost caused themselves by blocking off the cave entrance. Um, I swear to you, you just, there's no reason you should believe this, but I, I have no evidence to back it up, obviously. I swear my first thought was to Spore drive the Discovery in front of the mountain that has the avalanche and try to block it with the ship's shields. I swear to you, that was my first thought. And I said, that's way too crazy. They can't do that. Well, you know, after much arguing, again, between Rainer and Burnham, at a very, very bad time to be arguing, real people would not be able to argue at a time like that. They would be hyperventilating. Um... Good thing these aren't real people. Uh, good thing Admiral Vance didn't firmly establish the chain of command here. Thanks, Vance. Thanks, Kovish, for not telling us what the Red Directive really is. Thanks for being mysterious and dramatic. Uh, well, they go ahead and they actually have the Antares and Discovery plow into the mountain and deflect the avalanche with the ship shields. That's what happens. That's really what happens here. <laughs> that was my first idea and craziest idea. And they went with it. So, bravo, guys. Bravo. Uh, golf clap? Bravo. Um, but on second viewing, I remember thinking, do the nacelles have shield emitters? The nacelles are detached. Could we have shot the nacelles at the mountain, activate the shield emitters like full power, 
and just use the nacelles to block the avalanche without risking any of the crew. After, of course, flushing the nacelles of warp plasma so they're not da super dangerous. There's an idea. These ships have detached parts now. Use it. Maybe there's a cool way we can, do, we can uh, you know, have the ship shoot parts of its own body around. Body. Hull. Maybe. Maybe we'll see that in this season. That was that was an idea I didn't have at first, but it admittedly came to me on repeat viewings of this episode. This episode, by the way, I did enjoy it a little bit more in my second viewing. It's not that bad. Um, that's how they save the day eventually. But of course, Maul and Lack get away. Well, we saved the people in this village on this planet. They're all cheering and they're all happy that they were saved. Although, I mean, if I was on that planet, I wouldn't know what I was looking at. All I knew was that the world was about to end, and then two ships appeared, and then they're jammed in the ground. I don't know if the ships caused the problem or what happened. I would be so confused. I think I would be uh, in, huddled in a ball, not looking around and clapping. Just That's just me. I'm a little bit more afraid of these things. Um, I belong in, in engineering. Just leave me in there. Uh, Malalak, get back here. Uh... Very, very, very smartly, when we uh, when we recover Fred's body, uh, we can actually l view his memories recorded in his brain of him looking at the at the book. Smart, S good, good piece of writing. Smart. Uh, you want the you want an episode or a movie to do something where you say, "I should have thought of that," and that kind of happened here. They actually are able to view his memories. He is a robot. He is like Data. He is an android. So we look into his brain, and we actually view like a video recording of him looking at the book. Wow, a book that thick? Looks like it contains two to three uh, poetic and vague uh, parables. This is a modern TV show. We can't just talk to you like I am now. I have to talk to you as if beyond time and stars, there can be a way for us to retrieve the truth. Wow, I wish you Romulans were a little bit more clear about this. At least when we view the holographic recording of Dr. Velik, uh, his voice cuts out when he gives like the more detailed bits of information. Um, if this was like Picard season one or something, he would just say outright like, in such a densely packed stacking doll of poetic verses, what he's trying to get across. You know, the way you talk when you're not a scientist or something, or you're not an astronaut of some sort, like everyone is in the show. That way, that's how they would talk normally in, a, you know, old Star Trek Picard. But at least the, the recording is broken up from this 800-year-old ship. Poor Dr. Velik's body is still on that ship. We should recover it and give him a proper Romulan burial. Whatever that entails, I, I don't know. Um... Do you want to know what this stuff is about? Do you want to know what we're doing here? Maul and Lack have gotten away. It's time for a little bit of debriefing time with Dr. Kovic. Dr. Kovic, what are we doing here? Uh, you see, I asked uh, Tilly somehow very awkwardly to hack into the Federation's database to figure out what's going on with the Red Directive and all this stuff that's been classified for centuries. And she got away with it because Vance walked in and just ignored it because he wanted to see what the secret was, too, and nobody's in trouble. And Tilly had this weird-as-hell conversation with just some character. I don't know who it was. She was she was drunk, and he wasn't. Is it hot in here? I need a coffee. Well, am I missing... What? Were we missing a scene? <laughs> they came from that party, walked here, Burnham asked Tilly to hack into the Federation database because she's outside the command structure of the Discovery now. This is this exactly this thing. Didn't this happen in Picard season three? Seven of Nine is outside the structure of the Titan or something like that, and they ha she has to get asked. She's asked to do something against what Shaw wanted. Isn't didn't that something like that happen? We're doing it again with Tilly, 
But Tilly is drunk, has some coffee, and then hacks Federation database. C really? This person from a thousand years ago? Man, I can't even imagine how hard that must be to hack that. I <laughs> what in the world? Uh, that's all right. I just got to run this algorithm. Boop. And then I, we don't really find out what it is. They don't read it. The, 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 the plot with Tilly here was almost for no reason. It felt like, is this a backdoor pilot into the Star Trek Academy series? Is that what this is? Is it going to be about Tilly and cadets like getting drunk and then laughing at each other and then me feeling like an idiot because I don't know what's going on where I feel like a scene was cut at the last minute and we needed it to understand how we got from there to here. It's been a long road. Uh, I don't know. But uh, Cove is just not at liberty to discuss it. He's glad, I guess, that Admiral Vance uh, uh, let Tilly get away with it because uh, we have a team on it. And uh, Michael Burnham, that team is you. He gives her the S, the infinity symbol thing. Kind of like this is a symbol that you're on the case now. Kovish calls it Season 5. Finding the... The Thing. <laughs> Welcome to Season 5, Burnham. We're finding the thing. Here you go. The universe depends on you. Thanks. Let's fly. Which she literally says. Surprisingly, I didn't hate that. Um, so what's the deal? What's the sitch? The hook. Remember the episode of TNG called The Chase? Spoiler alert. I didn't. I don't know if I heard the name Dr. Velik before this. I can't remember it, if it was in TNG or not. But of course I knew the episode The Chase. Go watch it. I'm not going to, like, give you the plot synopsis right here. Uh, but as soon as Dr. Kovic showed Michael Burnham that frame from the episode, I knew immediately... I knew immediately that frame. I was like, oh, it's the chase. I knew from the frame. I didn't get the name, but the frame. I was like, the chase. Dr. Velik. I don't know if I heard that before this point, but I, as soon as I saw that frame, I was like, let's go. Let's go. It's the chase. Here we go. Here we go. This is this is the this is the foundation stone of this whole season. We finally know now. Uh maybe you could have gleaned this beforehand. All I all I watched was that trailer. The one I react to. I don't I didn't look up anything but beyond that. Um, John Luke Picard, after following you know, a trail of breadcrumbs, like a modern Star Trek season, the chase would have been a 10-episode season today, but they got it done in one episode back in the day. Or was it a two-parter? I don't think it was. Um, there's a race of people, spoilers, that we're calling the progenitors. The original race, the original humanoid sentient race that seeded... Uh, the known galaxy with humanoid life. Okay. That was the content. That was the sum total of the episode, the chase. I assume all the details of that episode and what happened in it when classified, that was, that's what was in the red directive. Anything that we reveal the truth about that is classified under red directive. It's been classified for centuries. This is my assumption. It comes from the highest, highest office of the United Federation of Planets. Dr. Velik was the Romulan that was in that derelict 800 and some year old ship. He discovered the secrets of the progenitor technology. He wrote it down in that book, put it in the puzzle box. Lack and Maul have gotten away with it. We know what it is. They probably don't understand the magnitude of it. We have to get it back. That technology could be very dangerous. Think of it like a Genesis device on steroids. That's my assumption. Maybe I'm totally wrong. But you can see now why it's important that we get it back. I wish we hadn't known that earlier. While looking at Fred's body, Culber and Stamets are musing about legacy. Wow, he has the serial number AS. Eric Sung, Alton Sung, one of the Sungs. Stamets looks off into the distance like this was directed by a five-year-old. Look off into the distance, longingly. Think about the future. Think about your future. Think about your lost legacy. He looks around and says, Wow, imagine having such a legacy. Hmm. And the viewer is thinking, Lost legacy? Just how you're losing your legacy from losing the spore drive. 
We're getting rid of the spore drive. Hmm. Is that the theme of this series? Season, I should say. Picard Season 3. Legacy. What You Leave Behind. Discovery Season 5. Losing Your Legacy. Maybe that's the kind of like meta narrative here, you know? Um, and we do have a scene where Tarina and Seru kind of like, you know, make their feelings known for each other with regards to marriage. I think they're getting married. Um, he's getting hitched. Um, if you excuse that. Um, you know, there's a lot of love. There's a lot of legacy. Is that what we're establishing for this season? Remember I said it, I remember I said it was important what we established in episode one. Tarina, Seru, love, book, Burnham, love, uh, Stamets, Culber, all that's been going on for a long time, love. Um and then also what you don't get to leave behind. Like losing legacy, allowing an old thing to die. Maybe the pathway drive just is better than the spore drive. One would think. Um, is that what you were thinking? Did you pick up on these little thematic notes? I certainly did. Visually, it was a bit of a kaleidoscope. I'm, in the last few seasons of Discoveries, I'm having a hard time telling what's going on. Maybe I'm just old. Um, in addition to that, though, some of the uh, green screening looked very, very amateur. It looked very bad. I I mean, maybe they're in that wraparound projector that they were in before to do those large open scenes with, the kind of like new technology, and it's not just a flat green screen as before. But there are some scenes that look really nasty. Um, to me, uh, Michael Burnham flying around in space and landing on that ship looked fake to me. It looked plasticky. It looked very fake to me. Something about the rigging of the model, the animation looked fake. Uh, the green screen with uh, Rainer in front of the background on that planet, uh, Kamau, I think it was called, looked fake as hell. Um, hey, little hiccups like that, it's not that big of a deal. Little tiny bits of mediocrity in, in the shadow of greatness is totally excusable. If the season's great, we're not going to notice these things. If the season is bad, it's going to stand out. So I'm letting you know about these things. I'm also letting you know that it doesn't really factor in that hard to this review. Um, plot line, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with kind of like digging back into TNG, scooping something out, saying, hey, there's a little more. We didn't recontextualize what happened in the past. We just said, Here, here's the next logical step. These Romulans, Cardassians... Klingons, humans, I think that was those were the characters that were on scene, you know, with John Luke Picard, found the progenitor race. Wouldn't one of them dig a little deeper? Hey, maybe. That's fine. I'm hooked in again. Plot wise, I know it's it's gonna be another breadcrumbs. I know it might be a get back your Malak storyline, but for what it's worth. I like this a lot more than what was set up in the first episodes of the last seasons. Um, you know, uh, we're on the chase again. I'm I'm on board. Um, pound for pound, it was just more interesting some way. The way it was presented, the way the box opened and we showed something. The way Fred read it and then we read what he had read looking at a video. Cool. Like, the logical steps, finding each puzzle piece, taking the next step being proactive and not totally reactive. We made steps into discovering what's going on in the plot without necessarily always needing to find another thing. You know, a fetch quest. We we managed to avoid the fetch quest this episode. We'll see how it plays in the in this season. So for what it is, it's executed better than I would expect it. Um, musically, like I said, there's some jazzy moments. There's some stuff right out of TOS. Very cool, especially when we uh, spore drive to that planet where we uh, need to find Maul and Lack. You know, we're winning on a lot of fronts here. Um, maybe I'm being a little bit presumptuous. Maybe I'm giving it too much slack. Um, where this episode is losing, though, is definitely the 
the superhero space stuff and the tension dissolving dialogue after something very scary happens, Michael Burnham chiming in with, well, it's another Tuesday, wink, wink, that kind of, it's, I just don't need it. I don't know. It's not for me, but it's more or less winning everywhere else. It does kind of have the ugly holograms in front of everything. I've never been a fan of that. Those should have been opaque. We should have been actually materializing something that we can interact with in 3D space that floats in front of us from programmable material. That would have been way cooler than a hard-to-look-at hologram, in my in my view. Um, that was Discovery Season Five, Episode One: The Red Directive. Um, if you can't tell, I'm not that I'm I'm not that hard on it really this time. It was better on second viewing. It was adventurous. It got me excited. Hit just some amount of right buttons with a few flubs here and there. I'm going to have to go with a solid 6.5 for this episode. One of the better season openers for this show, honestly, to be honest with you. Um, we, we weren't left with a ton of questions. That's a good thing. We're following breadcrumbs. We're looking for puzzle pieces. But we're getting a little bit along the way. And we're saving the day, too. We're saving the day on that planet. Um, you know, we're, we're learning about our legacy, the mark we leave in this universe. Uh, maybe Stamets isn't really as much of a luminary as he thought he was. He is from the ancient past anyway. And let's see where this season ends up. So, uh, in lieu of saying let's fly, uh, how about let's go? I'm Lieutenant Mark, and I'm going to see you when next time I see you. So long.